Hi, everybody. Hi, Ashley. Hi. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm good. Happy Monday. Happy Monday to you and to you, um, to everyone who's here tonight. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. We're so happy to be connected this evening, uh, even though we're all in different places and all isolated at home. Um, so I'm Carl, I'm the Artistic Programs Manager at Playwrights. I'm Ashley, I'm the Dramaturg. Um, we're so happy you're here, like we said. Um, you know, this program, Perspectives on Playwriting, which we call POP for short, has been around at Playwrights for about four years. We've mostly been doing live in-person events at our theater on 42nd Street. Um, but in the spring, when we all had to switch gears pretty quickly, we figured out a way to continue doing this program uh, digitally, which, you know, is definitely not what we had in mind <laughs> originally, but, you know, um, doing classes in this way has allowed us an opportunity to stay connected to our audiences, to stay connected to artists, to compensate artists, to connect audiences and artists together, uh, to continue to celebrate process, uh, even though we can't make theater right now in the way that we're used to. And, um, and you know, hopefully, uh, you know, find uh, reasons for joy and reasons for um, being in community together and uh, it feels worth it to us. So, you know, this, it goes without saying that this is a pretty, you know, unstable time and a pretty nerve wracking time and a scary time and a painful time. Um, but we believe that there's value in making this space and in being connected together. So uh, thanks for being a part of it. It means a lot to us and hopefully it means a lot to you too. Um, many of you are here tonight because you are, are probably artists um, of some stripe, you know, writers or directors or performers, musicians, uh, people who are familiar with Heather's work and, and are eager to hear from her and maybe find some tools that will be useful to you as you continue to make things right now and, and, and into the future. Um, many of you here tonight probably are not makers of any kind and you just are theater lovers or have seen Heather's work and want to know more about how she does what she does. And that is really exciting too. We're so happy that you're here as well. This program is for everybody. It's, it's designed for people to opt into from wherever they are um, and we're all in it together. So Thank you. Thanks for being in it with us. Um, the last thing I would say for now is that uh, Heather suggested that folks might want to have a paper and pen handy. Not required, but you might find it useful as we go tonight. Thanks, Carl. And yeah, I just want to echo that. Thanks to um, all of you for being here. Um, I'm speaking to you right now from the homelands of the Muncie, Delaware Nation and the Matinecock Chieftaincy. And I just want to take a moment to situate Playwrights Horizons with an acknowledgement that we developed in conversation with the Lenape Center. So Playwrights Horizons acknowledges that our theater, located on the island of Manahata, is situated on land that is Lenape Hoking, homeland of the Lenape. We pay respect to the Lenape peoples, Lenape elders, and their ancestors, past, present, and future. And as our theater's work and community extends beyond this island, we acknowledge that the Northeast is the homeland of many Indigenous nations. Playwrights Horizons pays respect to all Indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land throughout the generations and to their ongoing contributions culturally, intellectually, artistically, and spiritually. And because we're gathering digitally, um, we want to give a shout out to Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show in Ontario, who sagely invites us to take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to do a quick order of operations. Heather is going to take the floor for the first 30 minutes and she'll lead us through a presentation. Carl and I will be floating nearby off screen, off camera, in case we need to pop in at any point. Um, but we're going to fully reemerge to facilitate a Q&A, which will be um, roughly another 30 minutes. And so on YouTube, you can use the chat function, like chat with each other, send love to Heather. Um, and at any point throughout the presentation tonight, you can type questions or save your questions for the Q&A. It's all good. Um, and our colleague Iman is going to be present in the chat and um, 
yeah, and we'll try to get to everybody's questions. We'll, we, we might not get to every everything this evening, but we're gonna do our best and we're gonna try to keep things moving um, and answer as many questions as we can. And um, a quick reminder too, that we are gonna be recording this event for potential release down the line. Um, and, and Ashley sort of spoke to this already, but you know, as, as we're going tonight, as Heather is sharing, um, feel free to type questions in at any point and we'll, we'll sort of gather them as we go and then um, we'll facilitate the Q&A with Heather after the presentation. Um, and the last thing I would say is just that we're joined by Adriana tonight who's doing some live captioning for us. So just wanna thank her um, for her work and being part of this tonight as well. Um, I think that's it for us in our intro spiel. Uh, Heather, we would love to formally welcome you to the digital stage. Yay. Hello. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Yay. Good to see Hi. you. Thank you for being here. I am honored to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Cool, um, okay, so we're, we're gonna disappear, but we'll just be floating in the ether and uh, give us a shout if you need anything at any point. Perfect, thank you so much. Okay, see you in a little bit. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate you being here. Um, I'm gonna be yakking at you for uh, 30 minutes. So um, I just want you to take a moment and make sure you've got everything you need. Um, I've got a tea, um, I've got a candle. I've got all these things to make myself feel like we're across the table from each other, which is ultimately what we want Zooms to feel like, but rarely feel like that. So I'm just gonna start slowly. I'm gonna give my first spiel slowly so you can prepare yourself tea or make the room as, as you feel. Um, okay, I'm gonna start with a story. When I was a teenager, um, I found this book by Annie Dillard um, at a bookstore in New Orleans. Um, this book is called Mornings Like This. Um, if you don't know what this book is, it is a book of what she calls found poems, which basically means that she has found random shards of text that she likes on billboards or in TV advertisements and Boy Scout handbooks and old medical textbooks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she found the shard of text that she liked and then she ingested it. She broke it out into lines and stanzas to show us that these seemingly mundane arrangements of words just needed the little extra nudge in order to be these truly elegant lines of poetry. So now like a paragraph from an instruction manual on rotating your own tires can have the second life as a piece of art. And I thought that was fabulous. I still think that that's fabulous. It's a little dishampy too, right? Like uh, this toilet was a piece of art all along. We just didn't realize it until we put it in this museum. Anyway, I found this book as a 14 year old aspiring poet. Yes, really. Um, and it was one of the things that started my now career long fascination with investigating all of the different kinds of things that I could mean when I say that I'm going to adapt an existing work. I do this both on and off stage. This is just the way that my brain is programmed. I have adapted ecclesiastical treatises from the 1100s into blues anthems and pop songs with the same enthusiasm that I have adapted all of the Star Trek themes into solo vocal pieces that I perform for my cat. So I think my first argument in favor of trying adaptation is it is fun. Uh, my second argument is it's kind of unavoidable. Um, and my third argument is that regardless of what the final piece ends up being, adaptation is an awesome generative tool. Um, okay. So I think it is a fallacy that artists just bump around living their lives, going to grocery stores and sitting in parks and cafes with a moleskin notebook to catch ideas that fall from the ceiling. I'm not saying that ceiling art doesn't happen because it does, but that is not the norm. I would say that out of every musical that I've made, I've averaged like two ceiling pieces a show, which is roughly one out of 13. This is a wild estimation. I didn't actually count them before this class, <laughs> but I think I'm in the ballpark. <clears throat> the rest of the work that makes up the show is a hunt. 
It is a strategic hunt that I have set out on for histories and narratives and forms and ephemera that can help me get my own words out of my own mouth, either by being in conversation with it or just by running it through my own expressive machine. When that is an obvious process, I call that adaptation. When that's not an obvious process, sometimes I don't mention it to anyone but the dramaturgs and directors. <laughs> Um, but where I usually fall is somewhere in the middle here. And I've started to call that cannibalization. And that's what I've decided to talk about today. Because quite frankly, I don't know if everybody does this. Am I the only person who does this? I don't, I guess I'm not. I hope I'm not, but who knows? So I wrote a show four years ago called Animal Wisdom which was a requiem within a requiem. Um, a requiem is a Catholic mass service said for the explicit purpose of putting a recently deceased soul in repose. The first recorded requiem mass in human history was in the first century AD, so it is old. When I say I made a requiem within a requiem, what I mean is that instead of structuring scenes around a traditional storytelling arc, I structured it to match the dramaturgical bullet points of a requiem mass. And then I stuffed a textually adapted requiem mass inside that. This was both a formal adaptation and a textual adaptation. The textual adaptation was inside the formal adaptation. So most people know that that 27 piece of music that we sang in the blackout was an adapted requiem mass, but not, not most people know that the whole piece was a formal adaptation of Requiem structure. And you wouldn't know that unless you read the script where I outlined that specifically. The cool thing about adapting a piece as old as the Requiem Mass is that enough time has elapsed between when it was made and when we're looking at it now that we can only hazard a guess as to why some things are where they are. Like why does a creed happen before communion? or why do they wash their hands after a consecration? We don't actually know these things. We have a good guess, um, but we trust that it is like that for a reason. And so we're not gonna look around with it. You have to trust that there's an emotional logic to it, a subliminal magic that you try to keep intact. I didn't actually understand the brass tacks of how the Requiem was functioning but I did know that it was effective in detonating something in me as a witness. Um, I'm telling you this story <clears throat> in order to say that giving your initial trust to a text or a story or a form that already works and just letting yourself play and riff inside of it can help you take the pressure off of your own back to make something brilliant, which at least for me is the main thing that stands between me and creativity, this pressure to make something brilliant. I've come to believe that each generative has at least two people inside of them with wildly different personalities and needs. There's a creative who makes something from nothing which is usually a mess. And then there is an editor who polishes that mess until it sings. This is likely not new information. Most artists that I've seen talk about making work say the same thing, that it's some sort of combination between spark and craft. But in order to encourage a spark, you have to consume life. And in order to further your craft, you have to be disciplined and oftentimes, these two things are very paradoxical to hold inside one body. This is just how I've codified this for myself. I have a creative, I have an editor. I also have a performer, but she's a fancy extension of my editor so, and she didn't show up to class today. So now my editor <clears throat> is a lot smarter than my creative. In fact, smart is not a term that I would use about my creative at all. Tickled easily. Yes, she's tickled easily. She is sometimes impassioned, curious. She's childlike. Um, she's pretty insecure. My creative needs specific things like unstructured time, like a life full of div diverse experiences, um, spontaneity, adventures, surprises, boons, heartbreaks, um, things to get mad as hell about, um, a subscription to Lapham's Quarterly, access to the National Geographic channel. She needs cool pens. 
you figure these things out. My editor needs different things. My editor needs a rigid working practice, highly structured time, meal plans, regular walks around the block, discipline with her technology, a paper planner, a rigorous data labeling system, to-do lists, and sometimes a deadline. And it is my job to take care of both of them. Both of these people are valuable and necessary. Weirdly, I find that it is society's perspective that artists are only the creative portions of themselves, while at the same time, it is my internal perspective as an artist that I am only working when I'm being my editor. Maybe that's just me. Um, the thing is, is that my editor can always go to work if there's something to work on. The creative has to go looking for something to have feelings about. Otherwise, they get mired down in this, I got to make something brilliant thing. And that is a one-way ticket to a block. The truth is, brilliant things don't just fly out of your mouth. They are whittled into existence through a laborious chipping away at mediocre things that may or may not have internal light. But no matter how true that is, <laughs> It's a hard thing to believe when you are staring at a blinking cursor. Ultimately, I feel like I've devised the system of cannibalization for myself just to get out of my own way and strike that question of what if it's not brilliant from my own vocabulary. When I'm cannibalizing, I'm already working with something that I've decided has value. That thing is giving a whole host of parameters to work inside. I'm just trying to get it to say something unobvious to me. I'm trying to get myself to say something unobvious to it. And that's a process. Now, what do I mean actually? I'm gonna try and illustrate all of that by briefly walking you through an adaptive piece that I made recently. Um, this is an example from a piece that was released this year over at Playwright Soundstage is called Prime, a Practical Breviary. Uh, the piece that we're going to look at is an adaptation of Psalm 19 that we lovingly referred to in the studio as Boomerang. If you are familiar with the Psalms, Psalm 19 is commonly titled The Law of the Lord is Perfect. So first, there's my macro spec. In this piece as a whole, I'm trying to adapt texts from a traditional Catholic prime church service in such a way that they have functionality in modern times from both pantheistic and atheistic perspectives. I feel intuitively that there is something wild and wise and applicable to be mined in these texts, and I am trying to find those nuggets. I'm approaching it with respect curiosity and a healthy dose of skepticism in order to get the thing that I want, which is a cool and effective piece of thing. Uh, Carl, can you bring up that first slide for me? Thank you, magic. Okay, Psalm 19 starts like this. The heavens declare the glory of the Lord, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech, Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Cool. So I decide that instead of adapting this text, I'm going to let this tell me that this is what the song should sound like. So a tiny piece of formal adapting then. The heavens are opening up and declaring the miracle of creation to the cosmos. If you've listened to the song in the podcast, then you can tell me whether or not that was an excess, a successful formal effort. The following stanzas are where I really started adapting the text. Carl, can you give me the next one? Thank you. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. I am interested in these images. The tent pitching, the bridegroom, I love how specific they are. 
I love that these images are not images that I'm used to seeing in religious texts. So let's keep those. Also, I am interested in this idea of the sun being a generous entity in general. Uh, so this is where I went with it. Can, uh, you can move us forward. Big, big, pitches tensed for itself, shuffles out into pavilions, both arms raised out of the bed of new and long-armed love. Big, big, plots its orbit, ovaled, makes an edge where there once was none, and gravity to throw and boomerang itself to be our sun. That's the first stanza. Let's move on to the second stanza. Okay, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm and all of them, all of them are righteous. So this really lit my brain on fire. The law of the Lord is perfect. What perfect law is that exactly? Um, is there a law that is undeniable, that is trustworthy, that is simple and wise, that is inescapable, that is firm, that is pure? Surely there's a law of nature that is all of those things. So I'm like, okay, how about Newton? Newton's third law of motion actually comes pretty close. And now I'm starting to have fun. This is what I did. You can move us on. Boomerang has perfect laws. Okay, boomerang. I use boomerang as a shorthand for Newton's third law of motion. For every action is an equal but opposite reaction. When I think about this, I think of a boomerang, as in what you send out comes right back to you. So boomerang. Boomerang has perfect laws. Because we die, we feed a maple. Because we live now, we are able to make the bed we'll lie in then. Boomerang says even aphids, chewing holes in floors they roam, will know the way the big, big functions, enough to revel in the foam. Boomerang's laws light the iris, light the candle in the mind, for every action is an action, for every pure act, love divine. And then I wrote a chorus, because I was having fun, and ultimately we are writing a pop adjacent song, and because why not try to emulsify all this? We can do the next slide. The boomerang is a cosmic act. You love the world, it loves you back. The boomerang's a cosmic act. You frame the world, it frames you back. All right, back to the Psalm, third stanza. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them, your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. Okay, clearly I liked all of these images again. I like the gold, I like the honey, we're gonna keep those. And then this, takes, this text takes this hard corner over here into warnings and servants and willful sins and not being able to trust oneself, asking who it needs to follow in order to remain blameless. There's a lot in here that I want to turn on its head or put under a microscope and really look at. This particular mass is about words. So I tried to zoom out and go contextually here. I tried to look at it through this lens and trust that the monks picked this psalm thematically. When you apply that here, although it is admittedly kind of a stretch, we, metaphorically speaking, are the words creation spoke and turned loose. And look how much we are capable of, both good and bad. In the same way, our words are turned loose and they have the same capacity to change whole histories and trajectories and therefore should be used wisely. We have to understand the power that lies in speaking something to existence. This is something that I agreed with. This is something I can get behind. We were spoken into existence by a very loud big bang or else from the mouth of God. It works both ways. 
but it's complex. It works better in a song. Next, next slide, please. So this is what I did. Boomerang is sweet like honey. Boomerang is bitten gold. Boomerang is comb fresh honey, licked from fingers. Hard corner. Boomerang is only words as words come from the mind that makes the person mold his sweet self in the likeness of the beast it takes to save a species. Boomerang makes people, makes a colony of people making themselves from words of the laws we heard from the mouth of rivers and the mouth of God. Uh, next song, please. Slide, please. And the psalm concludes with, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer, which I took as a recommendation for a musical gesture. I made this movie in my mind of this intentional song becoming a reverberation that extends across eons and has pleasing repercussions. I tried to make it sound like that. And then as you can see here, um, next slide, please. I repeated the chorus because this is still trying to be a song and slightly extended it as an attempt to deepen it and then drove, and then I tried to drive it home. The boomerang's a cosmic act. You build yourself a cataract over the world wound. The boomerang is a cosmic act. You name the world, it names you back. You name the world. And that was that. Um, so I now want you to do this with me. <laughs> I wanna lead you through a little exercise. Um, this is where your pen and paper are going to come in handy. You can also do this on your computer. You can do it on uh, a note-taking app on your phone. You know which materials work best for you. So please, please do you. Um, I'm going to show you a piece of text and I'd like you all to cannibalize it with me. Um, for the sake of inviting you, uh, actually into my house and into my heart tonight, um, I'm going to use a random piece of text that Annie, from that Annie Dillard book of found poems that I talked about earlier. So last night I did a random flip through for you, uh, which goes like this. It's a very high tech method. I use it quite a lot, actually. Um, and I landed on the following stanza, which is a stanza from a poem called Emergencies. Uh, which is found text from a 1989 handbook called Pre-Hospital Emergency Care and Crisis Intervention, which she has beat out into stanzas. And um, we are gonna now beat that into our own thing. Um, next slide, please. So this is what we're looking at. The heart is a hollow muscular organ, the size of a fist. Along the edges of the eyelids, are openings of many small oil glands, which help prevent the tears from evaporating too rapidly. We are gonna do this in three steps, which can be used separately or in concert with each other when you were doing this by yourself. We're adapting the content, we're adapting the form, and then we're gonna make it personal. So first we're gonna adapt this content. This is a first level. What I mean by this is that we're gonna take this piece of text and we're simply gonna get it out of our own mouths. In this pass, I pay attention to words or images I wanna keep. I pay attention to who I think this speaker is right now versus who I might like it to be. Um, I pick a noun and I run with it further down the road or I pick a verb and I run with it in a completely different direction. Um, just for the sake of transparency, I'm gonna show you what I did with these. Um, can we do the next slide, please? So I went, uh, the heart is a muscle that fits in my hand. The eyelids are open in multiple places. So things can come in and things can come out like worrying scenes in the entrance door and tears out the exit. We're gonna do a quick prototype. I'm gonna give you a minute and a half to adapt this text, but I don't want you to try and be brilliant. I just want you to try and fill the spec, okay? I have got one minute and 30 seconds on my stopwatch now and go for it.
All right, that's your time. Second level. Now we're gonna adapt the form. So now that I have this piece of text, I'm gonna run it through this second filter of formal adaptation. I'm gonna look at my original text and I'm gonna try and see it from a bird's eye view. What I can see from this text here is that it is terse, it is list-like, it's kind of cold. This is just what I'm latching onto. What you latch onto can be anything applied to the form. Like how does it look on the page? Um, does it stammer or does it flow? Is it a quick thought or is it a slow thought? Is it in first person? Is it in third person? Um, it's also okay to make classifications up. This is a thinking exercise. Um, decide if you want to mimic or play counterpoint to all of these things that you have decided about the text. Um, this is where I got. Could you pull up the next slide, please? The heart is a muscle, it fits in my hand. It weighs in at some ounces, but heavy. My eyes now stay open with lots of small glands that downturned catch shoes and upturned catch a bevy. The door swings both ways with the tears. All right, I'm gonna give you another minute and a half. Again, I'm not looking for brilliance. Let's go. That's your time. That one's a little harder in this context, right? Like a formal adaptation works a little bit better when you're dealing with something that has multiple sections and the form is a little bit more clear, but um, I still wanted to do it. <laughs> uh, third step, um, this is my favorite step. This is personalization. Um, when I'm doing a personalization pass, I ask myself, what does this remind you of in your life? Does it spark a memory? If so, what does that memory feel like or look like? How old do you feel when you think about these things? Or how old do you wish you could feel when you think about these things? Or who does it make you think of? Who do you wanna tell? Um, and then you run with those things for as far as it will, it, it will take you, or in this case, until I call time. Um, here is where I went. We can do the next slide. My heart is a muscle, it's tired. They say it's the size of my hand. It's too big to squeeze, like an orange in my pocket, and anyway weighs down the skipping. Don't let me go to sleep, mama, I wanna stay up so the fireworks stand to get in me. Cause a firework memory might give me some guts to explode, pop and fizzle and weep. If you can't tell, these turned into lyrics for me. <clears throat> that is because my primary default is to make something a song. That's just me. Um, this step, the personalization step, is the step that usually coincides with music for me, which is its own filter and its own violent editing machine. Music is not something that I can really teach to a group, um, as I believe it lives in every single person in a very different psychologically and emotionally and intellectual, uh, intellectual place. 
Um, but suffice it to say that as soon as a thing becomes personal to me, I start to hear it. So songwriting is not separate from any of this to me. It's a whole, it's not a wholly different exercise. It is just a different kind of pain. So, sorry, that was a digression. Back to the text at hand. It is your turn to personalize. Um, I'm gonna give you actually 30 more seconds to deal with this one. So you can take a little bit more time and really remember something if that comes up. Um, your two minutes starts now. And that's your time. All right, how'd you do? Um, Carl, you can bring me back. Thank you. Now, is what I made out of this Proust? No, it's not Proust. Maybe you made some Proust, but that's not the point. The point is, is that now I'm remembering something. I remember a feeling that I had once that I haven't really tried to articulate before. And that is a road that I can walk down in a more intentional way. That is a seed. So what you've got now is a seed. You can write backwards from it or you can write forwards from it. It can be a Christmas tree that you decorate. It can be an island in an archipelago that a larger piece wants to visit. You didn't have to write it with a project in mind for it to relate to a hole somewhere. Ultimately, in my opinion, <laughs> <laughs> or in my experience, everything to a certain degree is a thinking exercise to get you to everything else. The only reason that that process ever stopped for me is because I have declared it done for some reason. It's because I have said so. Um, and here's some last little things um, as I try to wrap up. <clears throat> It helps me to remind myself that good ideas are a renewable resource. It also helps me sometimes to remind myself that everything is disposable. Curating my relationship to both my creative and my editor selves helps me do those things so that I become less emotionally attached to the things that come out of me once they are out of me. That means when I'm working as a creative, I'm not inclined to label any far-fetched idea as boneheaded because I know that my editor will fix it before it gets in front of an audience. I know she will do this because, she, my, because my editor has taken a solemn vow of obedience to approach all of the material that the creative puts in front of her in a very detached way. It's as if I have dug it up from an anonymous source in an archeological dig. It will hurt no one's feelings 
when I inevitably excise the crap or excise the good ideas that don't belong there. Good ideas can also be crap if they're in the wrong place. Good ideas are disposable, but also they are a renewable resource. If you're interested um, in continuing to cannibalize with me during quarantine, <laughs> because I've found this deeply helpful to do during quarantine because I've not had much um, life experience to draw from. So I'm doing quite a lot of adapting these days. Um, there are some things that have helped me do this um, in a regular way, um, in a more efficient way, in a more convenient way. Um, three things. One, uh, I've amassed a library of ephemera. I have a library of oddities, which is research materials, um, magazines from the 70s, pictographic encyclopedias, textbooks full of outdated science. I will stress again, a subscription to Lapham's Quarterly. Um, they do, do I have one sitting around? I don't. Um, they, they do this really cool thing where they release issues on collective writings on one subject. So they'll do a whole issue on like nature or night or time or magic. Um, they collect writings everywhere from from all all time periods so in the same issue you'll have like lyrics from little nas and horace um they are incredibly yummy and every time i feel like i don't have something to write about that is the first place that i go to um a daily practice um i am not the first person to tell you this my my creative needs practice shooting from the hip in a low stakes way i think that's why it's called a practice it is writing practice. It is writing rehearsal. Um, you have to keep the pipes clean. I hesitate calling it journaling because that carries a certain expectation with it, but certainly regular scrawling is a very good idea. And three, a sense of play. Um, you have to curate this ability to convince yourself that you're just nine years old hot gluing sequins onto Lego houses rather than writing magnum opuses. Like no one has to be excited about that Lego house, but you. Not all art needs to have an audience. You'll know the ones that want them when it comes down to it. But first you make it because you wanna make it, either because it's a good time or because you've got something that needs help emulsifying while you continue to change and grow as a person and not just an artist. Um, ultimately, I think that every possible thought that could be thought has probably been thought. And we as modern artists might just be documenting how the articulation of those thoughts is evolving. So saying that you've got a new story that's never been told to me is a little like saying you've got a new feeling that no one's ever felt before. I think ultimately we're all adapting. We just haven't read all of the source texts yet. I take this as a great source of comfort. I hope you do too. I hope you don't find that nihilistic. Um, when I think of how much I don't know or I haven't read or that I don't understand, I feel a sense of wonder about the world. I want to consume it ravenously. Cultivating this appetite for knowledge and perspective in its varying mediums is the fuel that keeps this whole machine going. And that's all I got. Uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, and Carl and Ashley, you can come on back. We are back. Hello. Hello. That was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Yay. Thanks for having me. Um, so yes, we would love to invite folks on YouTube to uh, enter some questions if you have them. Um, to start, I, I wanna hear more about your Star Trek theme adaptations for your cat. <laughs> Tell me more about that. <laughs> okay, so um, I, I I watch a lot of Star Trek. This is like something that uh, I keep pretty uh, under my hat, but I am, I'm a Trekkie. Um, so all of the Star Trek themes are instrumentals. And during quarantine, I've started to watch the, the Star Trek series is that I've never seen. I had never seen uh, Deep Space Nine. I had never seen Discovery. I had mm -hmm. never seen it. So I write lyrics to all of these, all of these themes um, and I perform them for my cat. 
um, and they're they're fabulous. And I'm not going to perform one here because <laughs> that is a violation of my class. <laughs> and mm-hmm, uh, but get to know me and get to know my cat, and we'll talk. Cool. That actually makes me think of another question that Ashley wrote here. How do you know which of your pieces want to have an audience? Ah, um, there's a there's an internal hunger, right? Like it's. It's, it's one of two things. It's either like, oh shit, I have to get this out of me. I can't, I can't just like do this for myself. Or if the conversation is not over. Usually it's that for me of like this conversation is not over and it cannot, it literally cannot um, go any further until I put it in front of people who've not been steeped in all of the same research and thoughts that I have in order for me to answer the question that the piece is asking. I need to be in conversation with people. I need to catch them up with the shell and then ask them <laughs> um, where they fall. Um, and that helps me. Mm. Cool. Um, it's an so I have a question kind of relating to the sort of environmental ethos of the cannibalizing process um, mm-hmm. with the recycling and the renewability and disposing and transforming. Um, but Sarah has a question about how do you know when you've reached this point of knowing what is renewable and what should be thrown away? Mm-hmm. Um. That's a good question because it's hard and it's different in each circumstance. Usually, usually it's when it, it's at the very end. The very end is when it becomes clear that the piece is not is clunky or the piece is not um, is not functioning in the way that you want it to function. It's not doing the thing. It's not emulsifying, right? You have a gut feeling about what it should be doing. And something is standing in its way. And the thing that's standing in its, in its way is usually a thing that you're very proud of. Um, and I have just become ruthless um, in the last couple of years of my career of, you know, like it cannot stand in the way of the, of the whole thing. I have um, a very special graveyard actually in my house for the pieces that I'm very proud of that, that got cut last from shows. Um, when you're doing it uh, in the beginning of a process, it's less clear. It's more a hypothesis of like, I think that this is probably, and honestly, it's, it's usually just about time or attention of like, I'm digressing too far. I'm digressing too far and now I'm starting to feel like it's indulgent. My little red flag is it feels indulgent. When it starts to feel indulgent, then I, then I go to the mats and I start cutting. Mm-hmm. Or I go to the mats and I start trying to make a collage of the things that I liked about it and figure out how it's the same thing, which is actually what I prefer to do of like, how are these two separate things that I love actually the same thing? And can I, can I get them to play nice together? Um, which can lead to a lot of really cool formal ideas, actually. Um, but mostly it's gut. Mostly it's gut. And attention span, you have to trust your own attention span. Um. Cool. Uh, I have a question from Gracie. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you ask for feedback? Um, I mean, what do you generally ask people to look for in your pieces? I always ask people to tell me when there are attention flags or when. Um, it's, it, I have weird, I have, I have a weird answer to this because I primarily am dealing with pieces that have then become pieces of music. In a piece of music, it's, I'm mostly going for gut reactions. I'm mostly going for, am I taking you on this emotional trajectory with me? Because if I'm bringing your heart and I'm bringing your gut, your brain will follow. Um, so it's a little bit more abstract. Um, so the first thing that I ask people is where, where did your attention flag? Um, where did I lose you? Um, was there a place that you felt was um, that you didn't want to go? Um, I like answer. I like asking that question because it, it makes me think about whether or not I want to go there. It doesn't mean that the thing needs to be cut. It just means that I need to be really certain that I want to go there. 
and I need to spend some extra time being careful about what I'm doing. It also shows me what I'm doing. Um, and then I usually ask people what, um, what, what, what am I not allowed to cut? Because to me, everything is on the chopping block. That's just the way that I roll. I'm like, everything is on the chopping block. Is there anything you're going to get mad at me about <laughs> if I cut it? Um, and other than that, um, it really depends on person to person. I try to ask for a lot of different kinds of audiences. Um, I like to put my stuff in front of um, like experts in the field that I'm trying to deal with, which is an entirely different conversation and feedback session than it is with like, I need to put this in front of people who don't know anything about what I'm talking about or people who don't care about deep art. They just want to like listen to a nice music show. Like all of these audiences to me are valid and I, I want to be making something that speaks across all of these audiences. So um I try to get it, I mean, separately, don't do all that in the same session. You'll, you know, you'll, you'll go nuts, but uh, <laughs> different audiences at different times. Yeah. Um, cool. Thank you. Um, kind of sticking on the topic of re revision, um, Honda was wondering if you could talk about some tools or approaches that you use to begin the revision process, especially when editing feels less um, when editing is inspiring less excitement for you than generation? Yes. Um, it is like really, I do really um, like uh, artsy crafty crap with my revisioning pass. I, I really, this, this is, and I have to do it differently with every single time that I sit down to do it in order to fool myself into thinking that it is something I've never done before. So um, the things I've done recently are I'll print everything out and, um, and I'll just go in with like a, a cool colored pen. And, but usually what that ends up looking like is I strike all of the text and it is rewritten on the back. Um, that's, it's, it's a violent editing process. <laughs> um, so I like having the physical artifact of the paper. It also gets me away from this desk. I find that like this computer, this box that I'm staring into feels like the same conversation if I don't print it out. I will also do a thing where I will handwrite the thing that I am trying to, that I'm trying to edit in a, in a very fancy notebook, in a fancy notebook. <laughs> I bought like one of those big moleskin notebooks, like the big ones, like the folios. And so I'll write that, I'll write what I've got on the left side, and then I'll write my revision on the right side. And that makes me feel like I'm doing something of like my art or, or of value. And then in some situations when I'm trying to musicalize, when I'm trying to musicalize, and because that's oftentimes a very violent editing tool, um, I'll write down just the lines that I like on an index card and tape it to the top of the piano. Um, so I, I'm trying, I'm like constantly trying to figure out new ways in order to make editing sexy. Um, and sometimes that just comes down to pens and the kinds of paper. Um, and sometimes that is, that becomes like a thinking exercise. Um, I have a very quick, I'm sorry, Carl, I have a very quick follow-up to that. Um, Sarah just asked, what kind of pens do you like to write with? Is there mm -hmm. something specific you like? Yes, there is. Um, I, I like uh, micron pens. I'm a micron pen person. I love a micron pen. However, like the micron pen can feel very like highbrow. I try to have like things in all different categories um, because sometimes you just want like a, a stupid, you know, like pen that you got at the bank. Um, if you're really upset with what you're writing and you need to feel like liberty to mess up, like this is, that'll do you. But I like my micron pens and I like my black wing pencils. My black wing pencils make me feel legit. Um, but they're not, they're, they're a pencil and it's really, um, it's really soft, squishy lead. So it's impossible mm. to make it pretty. Um, but Leonard Bernstein used black wing pencils. So what's I, can for us ticonderoga folk can you describe a black wing pencil yes so a black wing pencil do i have one here 
Oh crap, no, I don't. Um, a black wing pencil. So it is, uh, the main thing about a black wing is that it's super soft lead. Um, it's like either a black or a silver casing. And the eraser is both flat so that it'll sit on a piano without rolling. It's flat and it's also um, retractable. You've got like three times more eraser in the little cartridge than, than it, you see. So you can do a lot of erasing and it's a really good eraser. Like it erases mm. very cleanly and it sharpens very cleanly. And it's just, it's very satisfying. <laughs> it sounds very satisfying. Yeah, it sounds amazing. Um, it's speaking sort of hearkening back to the exercise that we did um, mm -hmm. when you're working through steps one through three in the adaptive process that we went through do you keep um, returning to the source text every time or are you just going back to the previous adaptation the step prior I do both I do both um, I if I've if I've started it, if I've, if it's gone to a place in like the first step that I enjoy, sometimes I'll put the source text in check. I'll just put it in the back room and be like, okay, now this is my source text. Uh -huh. And then I'll work from there. Um, but if it's not giving me something that I, that has given me a road to walk down, then I'll go back to the source text and, and recheck in with it. Um, the source text is always there for you. Um, I don't, I try not to be so rigid with myself that I feel like I need to give it um, anything more than I need from it. <laughs> Unless I'm, a, I'm like purposefully adapting that text mm -hmm. and not just using it as a tool. Cool. Um, um, do you, Zach is wondering, do you typically move from words to music in that order or does it ever go in the other direction, especially at the beginning? Um, I do both. I do both. Um, I find when I'm, I've mostly done lyrics first recently, but my life has mostly been music first. Um, a song is written quicker if it's music first, I find. Um, usually if I'm, the reason I'm doing lyrics first is because I'm all, while I'm songwriting, I'm trying to challenge myself as a composer. And again, we come back to like separating these entities, like my writer self will be like, you can't make that work. I dare you to make that lyric work. I dare you to make that scan. And it'll do something really cool um, when I'm trying to put it into the music. It'll like take me out of, out of a formula um, and take it someplace pretty cool. So that's what's been turning me on recently is starting lyrics first. Um, it, but like I've, I've, I've done both. Um, it's more fun when the music comes first. When why, music why, comes first. why is that? Because it feels like it was delivered because those are, when I talk about the ceiling art, like that's what it feels like. Like um, when music comes first, at least for me, if, mu if music is coming first, it means like something has just appeared in the room <laughs> and I'm like, okay, let's get this down. And then I'm just like asking it, what are you about? Like, what are you about? Like, what do you, like, how do I feel? And then that, but that turns into like, you know, like a, a bonkers preschool music improvisational exercise at the piano where I'm just trying to sing how, how it feels. Mm -hmm. um, and then that intonation turns into like, oh, that could be, that, that sounds like this word. So now I have these fence posts. Um, it's a, it's, a, it's a more abstract process mm -hmm. that makes me 100% not feel like a professional, which is exactly how I wanna feel. I never wanna feel like I'm a professional. <laughs> um, so that's why I think it's more fun. It's, it's bonkers, it's a bonkers thing. Is your ceiling art mostly music? Mostly. Yeah. I mean, I, mostly music, sometimes uh, formal ideas like big macro ideas um, sometimes fall from the ceiling. Um, text rarely falls from the ceiling for me. Um, we actually have a question from Lucy. When you, can you define what you mean when you say a formal idea? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, what does that mean to you? When I, when I say formal idea, I mean uh, like something that's gonna deal with the container 
of the piece. Um, I am a form nerd. So like I, I am oftentimes just as jacked up about how the piece is framed and how the piece expresses as I am about what content it is stuffed with. So um, like a big formal revelation for me was when I was writing my last piece um, at Ars Nova, Oratorio for Living Things. The big formal idea was I was like, oh crap, it's an oratorio. Um, I think it's an oratorio. So like that, that's, that's what I mean by formal. Yeah, cool. How do you meet the forms that you like get excited by, if that makes sense? Like, had you come across an oratorio before that you were like stoked about or, you know, was it just like in the ether or like in the back of your head somewhere? Um, I, I had no notice. I, I, I loved, I've been in love with Carmen and Burana. That's been um, like a 20 year love affair. Um, I was classically trained at quite an early age. So a lot of classical music forms I've just already got in my Rolodex. Um, but because I didn't study it like formally in college, they feel, um, I feel like I can screw around with them. Um, and then it's just like, I'm an omnivore. I'm an omnivore of all things um, art. So I, I do a lot of watching and I do a lot of, especially with old, old art. I do a lot of um, reading. I do a lot of um, investigations of old um, arcane uh, performative ephemera um, from ancient Rome and ancient Greece. I'm always looking for a good container. I do, I do do a quite a lot of like Tupperware shopping in that way. Um, if I run across something I've never encountered before, it's a real like, <gasps> <laughs> how do I use that? Cool. Um, there's a question here that sort of touches on that to me a little bit. Do you exclusively, it sounds like maybe the answer is no, but do you exclusively adapt from text as a source or do you sometimes adapt, cannibalize from other forms, um, other music or images? From yes. I approach like everything is a cannibalization to me. Like I, the text, it's the most clear thing to talk about and illustrate. Um, but I, I, yeah, it, it applies to, to me, it applies to, to everything, especially when you're writing a song. I mean, it is impo it's impossible to sit down at an instrument and, and say like, okay, I'm going to try something that's not like, I'm going to try a form that's never been done before. Like there are no forms that have never been done before musically. Like there's textbooks and theories written about this stuff. So inevitably you are cannibalizing something. So you might as well make a decision about like which two things you're trying to cross pollinate or like what you're trying to disrupt. Um, you know, make a decision about it in the offset, even if it means that you absolutely are not going to do that. Um, I find that the most important thing is parameters, is if you find the form that you're cannibalizing or adapting, it gives you a parameter inside and that makes you more creative. It stops, it sort of stops the brain spiral of like, oh, well, I don't know what to do now or I don't know what to do next. You're constantly in conversation with something. So it's less an intention thing and it's more a perspective thing, I think. Um, so I think we have time for just a couple of more questions. Um, and we do have a couple that are about, about your editor self. Mm -hmm. Um, so somebody was wondering, do you ever have to put your editor perspective in check? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But like, that's why, that's why I have the list of like things that my creative needs is because the, the thing is, is that the my editor has like an overblown sense of, um, I don't know, it's, it's, she, she's, she's grandiose. She's, she's constantly in the room. I have to sit her down. Um, that's more difficult than like getting the creative to sit down. Um, the only way that I figured out how to do that is to like give the creative more candy. Um, of like, you know, we're, we're, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not making something neat right now. We're not making something good right now. And if I can't get out of that, 
then I'll scrap what I'm doing and find something for her to edit. And then once she's gotten that out of her system, then we'll go back to the task at hand, make something new. Um, and it happens at, like there's different parts of the day too. Like all of us are different, but I, and I go through cycles. My morning brain is an editing brain. Mm -hmm. At around seven o'clock, my creative brain turns on. Um, so between like two and six, I live my life. But in the morning, <laughs> I'm editing. And after seven, I am, I'm making new things. And that's what's been working for me in this cycle. Um, because that's how my brain is programmed. But I think everybody's is probably different. Um, another sort of piece of the editor question, um, this belief that uh, your editor thinks that everything is on the table. Um, does that feel like a non-negotiable to you? Does that feel like it's non-negotiable? Yeah, the, that um, it, it, it must it always be true that everything is on the table. No, it must not always be true that everything is on the table, but I mean, you're making these rules for yourself. Right. I, it's easy for me to say that because I'm the kind of person that as soon as something comes out of me, I'm in love with it for 12 hours and then it's the stinkiest piece of crap that has ever existed in the history of, of art making. And then I've got a period of about two months where that remains true. And then I can go back and I can look at it with new eyes. Mm -hmm. So I, if I'm trying to make something quickly, then it has to be true that everything is on the table. But if it's not, if it doesn't have to be made, made quickly, then I have that time and I know that I will you know, I will have an emotional distance from the thing where I, where I can say, you know, this still means something to me. I'm going to take that seriously. Um, but it does bring up this, this interesting thing of like, this is why it takes years to like make a piece. It's not because you're writing the thing constantly for years. It's because you need time in between when you're working on things in order to get detached from it enough to know actually like what's important to you about it. Like that will remain across the years of the process. Um, and if it doesn't, then certainly that's on the table. Awesome. Um, we had another question come in that I'm just gonna slip in before we finish. Um, but Honda was wondering, so as um, Honda was doing the exercise, um, they say, I think I was already adapting the text form at the same time that I adapted its content. How would you try to separate that or wouldn't you bother? Um, I, so for the, the purpose of this exercise, it gets a little finicky because like the formal adaptation really works best if you're dealing with a much larger piece of thing. Um, I wouldn't really worry about it. Like to me, it's it, like the formal adaptation is just a new perspective. Um, I am also, while I'm, to, to be honest, like while I'm adapting textually, I am also adapting formally because I, I'm looking at everything through a formal lens because that's my personality <laughs> and that's my obsession. Um, I, yeah, I wouldn't stop yourself from doing that if that's something that's naturally happening. Um, I just think that some people are programmed more to deal with words and some people are programmed more to deal with structure and architecture. And so I like to beat it out into two things just in case somebody has, um, you know, it has a strength or a weakness with either. You're forced to do both. If you're already doing both, more power to you. Very cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. This Yay, was so rad. Yeah. Really awesome. Um, if people want to, you know, find you or your work on online, where would be the best place for folks to do that? Um, so um, my website is currently under construction. However, um, I have a band camp um, where all, all 10 of my records are there. Um, that is heatherchristian.bandcamp.com. Um, and I have also started a Patreon um, during quarantine where I'm releasing one um, what orphan a week of songs that didn't make it into shows. 
<laughs> were songs that got um, shoved under the carpet along with a love letter um, from one writer to another um, every week. And that is, uh, you can just like, it's, it, you can find me on, you know, my name, go to Patreon, type my name in. I don't know the name of the website. Um, but right now that's that I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Come find me. Awesome. Amazing. Um, so great. Thank, thanks for everybody for being here, for being a community with us tonight. It feels really awesome. Um, a dark November day to sort of be all in the same energy field, even though we can't see each other. So thank you. Um, we are going to do a couple more masterclasses in December. We're going to announce them in a couple days. Um, if you're on our mailing list, you'll probably hear about them. Uh, if you're not, you could sign up at phnyc.org um, or um, the POP page on our website is phnyc.org slash POP. I have to be very careful of my Midwestern accent when I say pop. Um, and uh, so keep an eye on that, uh, more news to come. But uh, yeah, this has been so awesome and we're excited to keep making a little bit more space together. And if you're at all inclined to support Playwrights Horizons and this pop program, we'd be so grateful. You can visit phnyc.org slash donate or even just text P-O-P-P-H to 44321. Um, Iman has put up our beautiful slide. Um, and if you also want to share any reflections or insights about your experience tonight, um, Carl and I would love to hear from you. You can write to us at pop at phnyc.org. Um, and yeah, that's it. We, we hope you and your loved ones are taking care and staying safe. Um, and we can't wait to see you back on 42nd Street at some point in the future. Um, thank you so much, Heather, for being here. And thank you, everyone, for being here also. Thank you, Heather. Bye, everybody. See you soon. Bye.